minutes of what they do in online classes. The reason they were chosen is that they have online classes. And then after that time, um, I have a number of cards. It's this cajoling is working. <laughs> that uh, we'll ask questions and whoever can answer it, go for it. And then I think we'll open it up to the audience and, and uh, further the discussion. So let's. Do you want to introduce them? I can't. I don't know who they are. <laughs> Do you want yeah. to introduce, introduce yourself, <laughs> please. Someone once said the best introduction I ever had was when I introduced myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Linda Stauffer, and um, I'm in the Sign Language, American Sign Language, English Interpretation class. We have an AA and a BA program. What would we want to do? You're going to tell us a little bit about how you handle do we want to, uh, online. Oh, <coughs> go ahead. We'll just do it as you come back. You guys are in charge now. All right. Uh, <laughs> Studies. Uh, I've been teaching, I teach at least one course per semester online from our, it crosses over from master's program as well as upper level undergraduate ESL endorsement courses in language acquisition, pedagogy, assessment, and I think I've been consistent, I think around, the, I don't remember, the fifth year I've been doing it, and I have some real pros and some real challenges, so we'll hope this year. I'm David Dearman. I teach accounting over in the College of Business. I've been teaching online classes at uh, previous institutions since about 2002. And uh, now I've, uh, I've had two online classes this semester, uh, which is, uh, I guess, a fairly common workload for the past couple of years. I'm a part of a little bit different feather in the sense that um, I do online, but it's a uh, synchronous uh, hookup with students in Tulsa and in Rural. And so we go, we're going through Wimba this summer. Previously, we went through like two of these uh, telephone lines. Um, and so we have students in two locations, but they're, they're both visual. Uh, but all the information and testing then has to be online. Uh, so the, the real challenge is how do you uh, bring students together when they're physically in two locations and don't in one location. And I do some a minimal amount of totally online and then a lot of uh, web enhanced courses. So um, it feels a little bit different each day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the, the challenges I think for me is, is I've been here 25 years and it's, it's just staying on top of the technology, trying to learn it and then incorporate it uh, because the students learn it faster than I do. They're using the technology <laughs> before I get to it. Uh, so, the, how do you transition from one year to another? If, you, if many courses I teach once a year, um, they can change drastically in terms of delivery, and then that change changes how you interact with the students. And, and I think one of the, the biggest challenges is, is building community. Um, students want um, instant access. They want to do everything in a texting manner, including writing, which uh, is very difficult. I think when I'm trying. To, you know, work with language learning and um, just build community when they're uh, either even in face to face, they're still texting each other. So um, that's, I, I think, is very important. But then I deal with a field that is face to face. You have to have visual contact in language. Um, so um, I, I think the challenge is using a different kind of online or distance technology with different kinds of classes. I almost think it would be easier if they were all one and all the other. I guess I'm not. Um, the major, I'm going to start with the positives. The positives that I've noticed over the last four or five years of doing it is that it has made it accessible to larger groups of people that might not have otherwise had access to these types of courses, this programming, what have you. Having said that, I haven't had a lot of people that are doing courses from other parts of the, of the country or world or what have you. But um, in my courses, some of the biggest issues that I've been dealing with are how to make, first of all, all the assignments that students are required to do would have been the same exact assignments in the classroom, which that's been probably the hardest part is trying to make sure that I'm replicating the exact same experience, which would be the obvious. But also to um, 
make sure that you know, a lot of people say, well, what if, you, what if, they, what if they're cheating? What about the, the assessment part of the coursework that you're doing? And so everything that I've done, particularly in the area of quizzes or, or testing, which I don't do much quizzes and testing, and that might be you know, heresy, but in the type of courses that I'm teaching, I want to see performance. I want to see that people understand how language is acquired. And the only way you can show me that is not by memorizing something, it's by demonstrating that someone has acquired language through analysis, through tape recordings, digital tape recordings, through analyzing linguistics. And so all the assignments have been things that there really hasn't been a way they could cheat on. I mean, any, but let's face it, you know, if they can cheat, they're going to find a way, whether it's online, in person, or whatever else. So I've tried to take, I guess, that number one on the sheet that they are adults. And um, I think they're all pretty clear when something appears to be cheating. It's relatively easy now to, to find out, did they just lift it from someplace else on the internet? I mean, it's, there's, you don't have to have special devices. Google is just fine for that, right? So everything that I've tried to do has all been geared towards problem solving, demonstration, which means it's been a lot of work, you know, on the, on the grading side, as well as on the communicating with students. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge of all is realizing that all these different students have different learning styles. They may all be there because they want the tech environment, they want to do it in their pajamas. Okay, that may be the only coordinating factor. But their different learning styles don't always pay attention to the instructions in the way that I think have been so clear or spelled out. Or I've given 10 <laughs> examples, you know. And I'm almost guilty of giving too much. And I've, in the last two years, have started taking stuff off. Because I think they just got, you know, they wanted more samples. What do you mean? What kind of paper does it need to look like? And so I brought a sample, and then, but what do you mean? You know, and it was just, even though you give more, it almost has become too much, too overwhelming. Uh, one thing, when I've, I've been writing a lot about technology the last few years, and one of the major things I try to always start with is the technology should not drive the instruction, the content should be driving the instruction. That's an obvious statement, but sometimes we get so whipped up. Ooh, I got my new iPad. You know, and, and that's great and fine. We need to keep up with the, the age group of our students and their interests, but at the same time, I'm trying to drive con content comes first and then how to plug in the assignments, the activities. Everything is PowerPoints, which is boring. You know, can we just go back to normal communication and discussion? But it seems like it's a good mode to at least start discussions. Um, only other thing I'll say is this week, talking about community is the last couple semesters I've been trying to work a lot harder on that because I, they are just isolated. And frankly, if you ask them, what do they say? I don't want to get together with somebody. That's why I'm taking the online <laughs> class. You know? That's not necessarily a good thing. But you know, reality, we need to look at reality too. Um, this week they're having to do a peer activity within Wimbo Live Classroom. Or, I mean, I've set it up where they can archive it, so I have a record. Or they can just go to chat. The chat feature of Blackboard, I mean, low tech on that one, you know, in terms of everything that's out there. But even that, at least, is an example where they talk more like they might talk if they were in person. Yeah, you know, and they might throw in slang. And I'm not interested in the slang. I'm not interested in the way they communicate. My goal is that they do this experiment where they look at samples of language and compare the linguistic features. And do they agree? You know, and so it's a way to sort of share chat with each other without being super formal. The thing that I would have done in the classroom, turn to each other, take a look, you guys agree, what do you think, let's talk about it. That chat has a log, so I have evidence that, you know, even though they may not have done it all at the same time, it's all out there and in their natural community format. So I'm going to shut up because I've talked too much about this. <laughs> Please, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to try to focus on how, uh, engaging the students uh, since uh, and that's the primary topic. And first, I would say that uh, the way that you use the technology is uh, related to the subject matter. And uh, accounting is, uh, at the uh, sophomore level particularly, is very structured, rule-oriented as we progress uh, through uh, senior level and in graduate studies. It becomes a lot more uh, uh, shades of gray and a lot of judgment uh, is involved. And so it's much less rules-oriented focus is in uh, letting students uh, bec become familiar with the rules at the early levels and then over time develop professional judgment uh, that they can apply in ambiguous situations. I love to place them in ambiguous 
those situations. The, uh, uh, I'll, I'll speak uh, primarily from the perspective of my junior level class, it's, uh, where it's uh, heavy, heavily oriented towards problem solving, but then we get into the uh, stages where at some point you've got to start exercising judgment because rules don't apply all the time. And so at the beginning of the semester, I, it's an online class, but I like students to try to get to know each other. So I'll have them uh, do a self-introduction assignment, uh, posting onto the uh, discussion page in Blackboard, a uh, uh, short blurb about themselves. Uh, I do the same and tell them some personal things, so I encourage them to do that as well. In, uh, I'll follow up with that by uh, pointing out a couple of things. First of all, this information is available for public consumption, at least public in the sense that everybody in class can read it. So uh, don't be sharing your deepest darkest secrets. <laughs> but uh, yes, and uh, but the, uh, also then I uh, would point out that uh, later in the semester we'll have a variety of group activities, and this is a good way to get to know your group members. Also follow up the, uh, the self-introductory assignment by going back to what they've said about themselves and uh, responding with a few comments of my own. Uh, comments sometimes are professional related comments. So what a great I heard that's a great place to work because I asked them to tell me about where have you worked, what your goal, career goals, and you know something personal about yourself, and among other things. And so I, I may interject some comments about I heard that's a great place to work, or I've lived there too, or you know they tell me they they got uh, three dogs and two cats. And I'll tell them, Dogs and cats are a great way to bring germs in the house and make, <laughs> your, make your children immune as opposed to sheltering their children. That's great idea. And, uh, so, uh, you know, try to make a connection to the students at that uh, at the personal level, uh, responding to their comments. And uh, then, uh, yes, build the uh, uh, content of the course around. Uh, I, I do it in a very structured way during the uh, semester we'll cover uh, pretty much the same, well, about uh, 16 chapters a semester that uh, divides the semester up into uh, four groups, uh, four midterm exams over four chapters each. And the, uh, each chapter is fairly uh, routine coverage. Here's the main points, problem solving techniques, and uh, uh, students are required to uh, provide them with the uh, uh, textbook problems at the end of the chapter, the, uh, they have those with the solutions so they can see those and work the problems. I call those practice exercises. They don't get any points for doing it, but they can do whatever they want to. I point out which ones they'll focus on because there's homework assignments related to those, uh, chap those uh, problems, but the homework assignments are algorithmic versions of the textbook problems. Same verbiage, but the numbers are different, so they get to an opportunity to apply that uh, uh, problem solving technique in a slightly different uh, situation so that it's, they have to try. Uh, and then I have uh, a quiz over each chapter, multiple choice quiz, but the multiple choice are rarely definitional, always some type of uh, either problem solving or uh, analysis or synthesis type questions as opposed to just definitional type questions. Don't like those, you know. Those are available for the practice multiple choice questions that I give them for a study, but uh, in terms of the <coughs> quiz itself, it requires more higher level uh, reasoning. And so we proceed like that throughout the semester, and as I said, I also uh, have uh, outside the textbook problems, uh, generally spreadsheet assignments or other things that I've brought in from my experience in the workplace and said, you know, here's how the textbook does it, but here's how it's really done. And, and so provide them with uh, some kind of hands-on, uh, fill-in-the-blank kind of uh, spreadsheet exercises. And uh, that uh, use the uh, concepts, concepts of the chapters over which we're working now. And make uh, some of those, at least four of those, those group activities. And the first uh, quarter of the course, there will uh, there's a couple of group activities, and they'll work with the same uh, other three group members. Uh, second quarter of the course, they'll switch around, and they're working with uh, different group members. And then in the last half of the course, I have a bit longer group activity where they get to choose who their group members are. 
and they can choose either someone they've worked with before or know that they want to avoid working with <laughs> person A and B because they, they disappeared until it was time to get credit for the assignment. So uh, uh, in terms of doing the group activities, I required that uh, one student just email me the uh, solution to the uh, activity, but everybody has to submit through Blackboard assignment an evaluation of the other group members. And I tell you, tell them that you know, if you're rating everybody fives, I better get consistent ratings from all the other group members because don't just give people credits. You know, essentially start exercising professional judgment and evaluating performance of your coworkers according to the way they actually perform rather than the way you want them to work. So uh, uh, try to engage them with uh, real work uh, place experiences. Uh, make connections on an individual level through the uh, semester as much as possible. When uh, you know, it, it's, when you really uh, the only way you can see their faces is look at the at the roster that's available in Moz. So that's a good stuff. We're fortunate. Gail Hughes is here. We're going to have a fourth. Good. And we'll finish off. Gail, could you tell a little about what you do? Sure. First of all, my apologies. I'm so integrated in technology. I show up when Google Calendar tells me to show up. I'm saying it's time I've been teaching online for about 10 years now. As I was driving over, I was thinking, you know, when did I start? When did I start? It's been a decade. Like, how time flies. Um, one thing, though, that I should say about this is I talked about what I've been doing for the past 10 years. It's just a couple of years ago, I realized that I kind of went at this whole thing with the wrong mindset. I went at it as, how can I take what I do in the classroom and transfer that to this online, asynchronous environment? And what I read a couple of years ago that really made me start thinking is that I was working under the assumption that everything I was doing in the classroom was the best model. So what we should be asking ourselves is not how can I take my classroom and put it online, but how can I make the best online classroom using the things that are new and different and available. But all that said, uh, when students enroll in my course, I like to send them a welcome letter a week out to the ULR email because as I'm sure all of you have found it's, you know, where do I find the course, what's the book, how's this going to work, I've never done this before. And so that email, along with a copy of the syllabus and a document I like to call How This Course Works, which walks them through the procedures to be on my course, really I find that eliminates some of that time. So when I finally do log into the Blackboard, there's that same welcome email for those that didn't check the ULR. <laughs> and um, they are already assigned into group discussion boards similar to what I've heard here. I do that by their major and as I think everyone does, I ask them to begin by introducing themselves and so I figure the onus should fall on me to model that and start that. So every group discussion board has my little blip about here's me, here's what I do, etc, etc, here's what I do for fun, both personal and professional to help them get to know me. Uh, by the way, for those of you that are totally async, I also read that it's extremely important and it's amazing how much of a difference it makes with the students. If somewhere in the course you give them a picture of you. So that when they go to Walmart and they run into you in the checkout line, they realize, oh, that is my instructor. And that's happened to me more times than I can tell. Like, oh, Dr. Keys, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. How are you? This person I've never seen before in my life. That's happened time and time again. But it's nice to be able to make that personal connection and get to meet them face to face. And so when they go in the course, they do their assignments. Uh, through group assignments. They do individual tests, they do individual papers, so I like to do a combination because as with online classrooms, we all have different learning styles. Some of us love to work in groups, some of us hate working in groups, so I like to offer students a mixture and make sure they do some of both. As far as the material goes, I teach graduate statistics and research courses, and I think, well, I do have a lot of adult, non-traditional students like myself who are used to having a physical person there explaining, going, here's what we're doing, here, 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 and here. Let's look at this graph as opposed to just reading the textbook. And so I did follow that traditional model of how can I bring the classroom to the student. And so what students have for every single chapter is they'll click and open, first of all, a PDF note file, which was what I always gave to my lecture students because I get so tired, especially with math anxiety, of teaching for three hours to a bunch of heads doing this making a complete transcript and not thinking and interacting with the content. So those notes were already prepared. So they print those off and then they click on a video and watch me as they would in a classroom, just walk them through the notes. You know, here's chapter one, here's what we're doing, here's what this means. And so I found that what I'm trying to do is tap into the different learning styles. Some people just read the textbook, some people read the textbook and the notes, some people watch the videos, some watch the videos just for the you know points they find. Uh, as far as the collaboration, they do they collaborate with 
coach other through the group discussion boards, and they collaborate with me through weekly emails. I find that it's very important, and I tell them at the very beginning what, I mean, I think the beginning of the course is so much about what we expect from them. We expect you to do this, 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 and this. So I also, during the second week of course, after they've settled in, send them an email about, here's what you can expect from me. That I'm generally online most days, and so if you send me an email, you can expect to get a response in an hour or two. However, there are days when I'm in meetings nonstop, and it may be the next day. I let them know that I will check over the weekend unless I'm out of town with family, that sometimes it is acceptable for me not to check email on the weekend. Just to kind of set those expectations from the beginning. I might not should be saying that. That may be something I get fired up for. Maybe it's 24-7 now. <laughs> but I like to set those expectations so they know. Um, let's see. Something else. Now that you've got some hooks to write more questions, feel free. Now let's start with this one. This, I think, is the big one. And I, and I like a, something from all of you. What's the biggest challenge to teaching a completely online course? Awesome. <laughs> Having set it up, this is expectations, you still have the students who have chosen, for better or worse, the course because they see it's online. Even if it's even if in your participation you raise the participation grade, you say these are, you must respond to at least as many blog entries or this many emails or this many discussions. You still you still get the students who are just out there. You know, at least that's been my experience the last several years. They just don't participate. You have the group that does, and then you have the group that doesn't. I don't see there's much, at least in my experience there hasn't been much in between. It's really been those who do it all the time like they're supposed to. Or those who just fade away in the woodwork, you know, and that's really even if you send them emails, hey, I haven't heard from you. What's going on, you know? And then maybe they'll send an email back, maybe they won't. But there's a real difference between those who participate all the time and those who don't. That's been my biggest challenge, trying to get collaboration. David, how about you? There's a lot of problems. <laughs>
Therefore, I usually have people paired up right away and do thought kinds of things for grades, projects together. And, and I understand the, the question of who did the work. And usually you'll hear right away when, when somebody's <laughs> not putting their weight. Um, but a, a product, a project uh, that they'll submit and present together. And I do have online quizzes, but they tend not to be graded. They tend to be for their, their self-diagnosis. Uh, and then, of course, on my end, that means there's a whole lot more time because even though I get the quizzes, they can self-grade in uh, Blackboard. But uh, if you're doing projects or um, thought pieces, you have to give a lot more time to grading them. So the, the time feels very different. I can't just plan for this class and plan for that class. Well, I still do, but not as easily. Well, I agree with everything that's been stated. I guess an odd comment that I have on that that's hard about the online, having taught totally online now for several years, I miss the students. They they still get to know me because they still have the videos, they have you know the weekly emails, they tell me they feel like it's a real class, they're getting to know me, but they're complete strangers to me, and I really miss that. That's hard. Okay, I see some themes in this. There are some people that uh, are doing hybrid classes, and where it, it, that's one, and then there's some that have in-class and remote students, and I, personally I had that, and it was the worst experience in my entire life. <laughs> so let's start with the hybrid. Um, have any of you had experience with hybrid? And if, if you have, explain it. It was the I best did. thing I ever did. We met every other week, everything was online, but we got that interaction, we had the face-to-face -face questions. But unfortunately, I can no longer do that because our program serves people across the country. And the funny thing is, I'm going back. <laughs> I'm in <laughs> it all this time. After seeing that there haven't been, there hasn't been as much demand externally, <laughs> and it's really kids in the dorm or you know on Cantrell, Abbott, whatever Boulevard. Um, I'm going back to the <coughs> bar, and and not it's not going to be every other week, but it's going to be five different meetings to try to get that face, to, that human connection back. Um, and even though I think online has some really awesome, awesome mm -hmm. aspects, and if I need to do it, I'll do it. But right now, it seems that the population who needs the coursework is not away. So we're going to try it. We're going to go back a step. Yeah. I've done it in the summer, and uh, I'm intrigued by the idea of doing it in a full semester, meeting every other week or every you know, once a month, you know, four or five times during the semester. Uh, my particular class, I know the students, online students generally say, gee, there's a lot of work involved here. I wish I had more opportunity to ask questions of the instructor. I said, well, man, I tell them uh, I'm always here, and they, of course, they know that. But it's nothing like the face-to-face -face experience, so there's no sense to that. So I'd like to do, um, that's a good idea to do it in the uh, regular semester. Yeah, and that's, I've been working with Linda Eason and uh, the, trying to put the definitions for the university, mm -hmm. uh, working on those committees. And, I really like the idea too. I think we, we tend to put more and more and more into whiteboard shells and require more and more and more, and we don't think we're, you know, where do we where do we take away from? Um, as, as somebody said, you can't require uh, you know um, six credits worth of work for three credits uh, actuality. So I, I think that the hybrid is a good idea. You can put some things in uh, in whiteboard, they can do things on their own through Wimba. But I like the idea of being able to have that interaction. And it, it talks to community, it talks to uh, building passion, and it talks to answering questions. So I think it could have a good idea. But that does beg who, who are our students. If we're recruiting nationally, that, that may have to look different, um, sort of an online hybrid. If it's their local, then you know that affords true face-to-face. -face. So I think we really need to see who we're trying to recruit into our programs. David, did you have a comment? Yeah, let me, I would like to add one thing, and particularly relates to uh, doing, I, I try to set up my class, this particular junior level class, where the students have basically the same experience <coughs> they take it online or in the classroom. Assignments are the same, the pacing of the materials is the same throughout the semester, so that, you know, two students, one online, one in the classroom, they're going to come out the other end, theoretically, with having that similar if not exactly the same experience. Uh, and I think there's opportunities for the uh, in-class classes to benefit from technology. For example, my in-class classes 
I don't spend nearly as much time testing. If, if uh, exams are good enough for online for my online students, they're good enough for the, my in-class students as well. And that all, you know, control uh, for, uh, uh, of the exam is just a matter of uh, technique and, uh, uh, you know, to me it's all about the learning. And if, if uh, students, you know, can have a testing experience that also contributes to the learning, that's fine. But I think I've got exams situated or designed so that there's not going to be anybody, you know, not, not much cheating going on that's not also going to be, it may, if there is, it's also going to result in more. <laughs> well, then to, to switch over to the uh, online and in class, any experiences with that concurrently? Where you have remote? I, it was a couple of years ago where we had compressed video. It was just, I want to throw up. I did compressed video back when it first started. So I'd like to go, who's got the question? Who asked the question? Uh, the question, uh, teaching a class with both online and in-class students, how do you handle discussions? Yeah, and, okay. that's right. And uh, I mean, that's what I do, but I find uh, in-class students can discuss things uh, naturally, but uh, adding students who are in you know, remote locations, uh, awkward, it's stilted, they come in at the wrong time for the discussion, uh, there is no natural give and take. And when you say that, you mean that at a certain hour, a certain time, their students online are supposed to log in and participate, or how exactly? Oh, no, they, exactly they log on at the beginning of the class time. Okay. And, and the class, in-person so class time. The in-person class time. Okay. okay. And then we have a discussion during the class. Okay. And so they're hearing it, it's an audio? Yeah, yeah. They can see it, everybody can hear them. Yeah. And they can hear everybody. Yeah. And it's that delay, too. I've done that as well with entire last semester I had a grad student who lived out of town and it was the delay factor. But we use Skype. I know I'm never supposed to use back to blackboard. But she wanted to demonstrate stuff. She wanted to show us things and it's a lot easier to upload material, websites, what have you, through outside of Blackboard, which I love Blackboard, but you know <laughs> it just works more simply and it was much more natural because but that was only one person, you know, who you would see. And, and it, it was natural in that case. But that person also chose to do it. Well, um, we've set up a, a, a new classroom in, uh, in uh, Dickinson 106 through um, STAR. But, um, <coughs> and we'll be trying it the first time this summer uh, through WIMBA. Where in the past we went through interactive television, so I could see both classes. I had students in front of me, and I had uh, ten students on the screen in front of me. So for me, it was a matter of not only remembering my material, but you know, switching over. So did I want them to look at me? Did I want to hone in on the student? Did I want to pan the students? Uh, so it was the technology part of it was was not difficult, but challenging. Um, I was exhausted by the end of the class. But we're going to do the same thing now, where we can get class to class visual, but through Wimba. So it won't just be an individual. And <clears throat> so um, they put some money into doing that. And, and so I'm very excited about it. I'll have eight students in Tulsa, ten students in Laura. And we will treat it as one class. They are one class. And so whenever I pair, I pair one from Little Rock with one from Tulsa. And I'll give some time during class time for them to literally stand <laughs> In front of the camera and look at each other, but also <laughs> with you know with Skype and Facebook and texting and telephone, there's there's no limit to the ways that they can interact. And distance is an issue. And generally, cost is many people have like I have a national calling plan with no limit. And I mean, certainly it's well enough that they can access each other on on, on those ways. We've experienced even with the television, no delay, and the picture was really good. The only problem was it would cut out every once in a while. So I <laughs> no, there were some issues with, the, with that, but I liked it. Um, and then, but our program also is committed to once or twice in the semester actually traveling to Tulsa and teaching back to Little Rock. Uh, in fact, we were just over there between snowstorms last weekend, <laughs> meeting on the cohort, uh, yeah, so that they already know who we are. We're already building community before we start teaching it because we will, we will not 
the intel set we were teaching. So uh, it's a it's a little bit different way of doing it, and um, I really like the visual to visual rather than one person at a time. So ask me at the end of the summer, I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> I did it two semesters already on interactive television, and it worked really well. Any other comments? Um, we talked about discussions. Uh, someone asked your recommendations for grading discussions, and someone else asked for prompting discussions, because I think you even mentioned it. Some people don't get involved. How do you make sure they get involved? And then, then maybe one of the ways you do it is through grading. How, how would you grade them? Well, as far as grading, when I started doing this a few years ago, I realized there was no way I was going to read every discussion board post by every student. And so I very quickly told them that the discussion board is their kitchen table. You're sitting around a kitchen table working this assignment together. Everyone should work all questions for the assignment because you all need all the learning. But I suggest that the leader assign one problem to each person. They're responsible for posting that to the board. Everyone then comments on, yeah, I see it that way. No, I don't. Here's what I think it is. And then the leader is then responsible for taking the assignment, typing it up as if they answered it themselves, submitting it to me, and I grade it. And if someone doesn't participate the way they should, then, or if there's even a question about how well they participated, leave that person's name off the assignment and I'll look into it. And that's the only time I then go to the discussion board and see how that person participated or did not participate. And it's worked well. I mean, there's still an issue with graduate professionals if such and such is not doing their work, such and such is doing the minimum, but I remind them that that's only one aspect of the course, that we all have different ways of learning, and basically they have to live with it. <laughs> and frankly, would it not be somewhat similar in real, in a, yes. in a non campus <laughs> environment? So, I mean, it's not, I think a lot of people think that you go there and then somehow it's the way people participate is completely different. It's somewhat different, but there really are, you could, if you had the same student in another class, you can almost always, if, if you have them for another course, like a graduate course or whatever, they tend to behave in much the same way in person as they do online, unless at the beginning like, the tech is really an issue, but, but then you'll get the email saying, I'm really sorry, this is the first time I've ever done this, I'm not really sure what to do, uh, bear with me, and I get a lot of those, actually, and those are my favorites, because that's admitting, I'm going to have some challenges, then I can work with them, it's the ones that don't say anything, that, you know, they, they oh yeah, this is no problem, I can do all this stuff, I can do the video online, I can do this, and they find out four weeks in the semester that they don't have quick time, or they don't have their player. Or they don't have, you know, what it is that you've designed a video assignment on, and they've just been hiding. Or you get the email, what videos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of that, what, this, what, that. I get that in face-to-face classes. -face yeah. 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 exactly. It's like, yeah. where was this? Did you look in Blackboard? We went over and <laughs> there's a link. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would uh, agree. I don't have uh, much discussion as far as, uh, you know, formally graded, except there is one formally graded discussion activity in this junior level class. And uh, I have some other discussion things going on, but it's just for the flow of information and allow students to interact. But one graded activity in which, uh, in this uh, particular class, we bring, I bring in some outside readings on a topic sort of related, and that is specifically a topic on uh, developing leadership skills. Uh, sort of related to the uh, accounting that's going on, but uh, I have uh, students do some reading on uh, the development of leadership skills, and I ask them to write a, a, in the discussion format just a, a brief, I call it a leadership essay, but it's really the answer to this question. What are some of the things that the accounting department do to help you and other students develop leadership skills? And so they, they to respond to that, and generally a parent applicant, then they don't need to get involved down into details, but a couple of brief paragraphs will answer the question. And so I tell them, and, you know, one of the expectations for this discussion assignment are that you're going to respond to the, uh, the question, this leadership essay, and give some ideas about how the accounting department might help you develop leadership skills. And then you're going to go in and read uh, th uh, three other people's uh, leadership essay and comment to them and you know, tell them, yeah, I agree with this or disagree with that and create a, you know, a sort, sort of a, a dialogue. In addition, you're to go to six people, including the ones that you commented on, but go to six people and the blackboard has a rating 
uh, tool where you can go in and sign a numerical value, uh, five for great and one for terrible or something in between. So I have them a, read and respond directly to someone's comments and raise others and so that when it comes time for me to grade that activity, I say, did they initiate a, uh, have a leadership essay, and I scan through some, but yes, not all of those. Did they respond to the required number of uh, comments, and did they rate the required number of comments? And that information is readily available on Blackboard just at the click of a button, so it's, it's uh, not time, not involved, no, time intensive at all. I'm going to throw in, I know I'm as moderator that this is not my job, <laughs> but uh, I've had great success turning non-discussions on Blackboard into just about 100% discussion. In class, 20%, online, 90%, 95%, and uh, I've got a paper on it, I'll, uh, you've probably got my link. If you're familiar with the Six Hats process from De Bono, it works like a champ. Everybody. It's focused. Everybody know that we're now going to talk negative, or we're now going to just talk emotional. And somehow, just that simple trick gets everybody writing pretty darn good comments. Okay. Oh, one last thing. I just found this interesting through the years with the group discussions. The group discussions are the most cited thing that show up on my class evaluations. And it's not that they all hate them. Half of them, it's the best thing that ever happened because they have that connection. But yes, the other half, get rid of those group discussions. I didn't like having to work with other people. So be prepared for that if you're incorporating it. You, they will show up on your evaluations. Here's a sticky one. Online tests. First, should you do them? And in some cases, I don't know how you, well, no, should you do them? And how do you handle them? Start anywhere. <laughs> well, as in an asynchronous course, I do post, I do my test online. As you know, in most cases, I never see my students. Um, one thing that I do that I, I know some professors don't do is I leave it up for a three-day window because, again, these are working professionals. I feel that requiring them to take the test from 7 to 9 on Monday night is, in many cases, unrealistic for my students. Um, once they open the test, they can only they, they can only open a test once. They have two hours from the time it opens. I write the test knowing it's open book, open notes. So it is more applied. And I think I'm somewhat lucky in teaching graduate stat and research courses. It's not in most cases like their brother can come help them answer the questions. And so I don't worry as much about the authenticity. In, in order to provide an equal uh, experience for both local and distance students, I have to do it online. But I switched away from multiple choice, true, false, you know, the typical uh, thing, to more thought pieces, more app application of knowledge, um, where they synthesize and apply what they've learned. And therefore, it's a lot harder to cheat. Um, and uh, like her, I'll give an extended, a more extended period of time uh, because of that. But I also control. They can only access it once, they, they have so long, uh, they can't go back to it, and so on. So that, and I tell them, be ready, be prepared before you go into it. But they'll have enough time so they can learn what they're going to do. I'd say that mine are all project-based. Um, rubrics are up and available on Blackboard at the very beginning, of course. They're samples of projects that have been done before. People say, well, won't they just copy? Won't they just you know, make that, use it as a template? The way the assignment's designed, you have to work with a language where you have to have data, you have to document linguistics. I mean, you, no two people are alike in this room when they speak. There's no two people that are learning a language or similar, similar characteristics. So they might glean something from it, but they, they really, they can't, they have to demonstrate what they've read, watched, discussed, participated. And the rubric says what the levels of performance are they have it before they ever start. And it's, it seems to work. I use the same one I use in the classroom. I get relatively the same, anecdotally same kind of response. Good. Yeah. Uh, testing is uh, yeah, necessary. And uh, I think uh, I do a lot of uh, multiple choice uh, questions as well. These are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, problem solving primarily and also some uh, judgments involved. Uh, some analysis. And Two students take an exam, they don't get the same exam. 
not necessarily. I mean, the uh, questions, even if all the questions were the same, they're not. But even if they were, they were kind of students in different sequence. Uh, the uh, tool of the blackboard is the uh, lockdown browser, so there's no, here's the question, let me go online and see, find what else I know. They can't do that. Uh, the only way that they could see was have somebody physically in the room with them or on, using the telephone, and uh, it's hard to translate those uh, accounting text problems in the telephone format. And also, it's the only really people that get, that get the album would be professional accountants that are bound by, you know, a code of honor not to do such things. So, you know, I, would say, you know, they, I don't fool myself that there's not cheating going on, but if they're clever enough to figure out how to cheat, then they're learning something. <laughs> How do do you quizzing that's worth a little bit less online and I use all those tools including you know the, the random selection of the order of the test questions, the random selection of the answers. So there's no way one person could do it and say, you know, here's 20, here are the answers and pass it off uh, because the next person is going to take it the next day. So you can minimize it. I, I'm not going to fool myself to think I would stop all of it. But, um, they have to be pretty ready when they sit down and take, take the quiz and they have to be really on the ball and have prepared a lot to figure out a way to, to, yeah, to cheat on that. And you know, I, I think that the grades generally are reflective of, of what uh, they're doing now. Uh, I will add that uh, Dunn gets these tests online and in the classroom and they get the same cross-section of results. Some students do well and some students don't. I think I'd like to add that I think we're all in, we're in, in the position of teaching more of high classes, upper level classes. My roots are in developmental math. I mean, I would hope there's a whole lot of people out there that can solve a simple equation for X, and I would be more concerned about students cheating when the, the questions are not applied and solving just simple equations here and there where they can have other people come in and help them or sit in a room together and I'll help you if you'll help me. And so that it, it yeah, would be a greater concern. Sitting in a classroom never stopped cheating, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, but, excuse me, that, that one of those is my question. If it is a core class, then you're saying there is no answer. A core, lower I've, level class. I've never had to think through that. I'm just thinking back, you know, if I were teaching my developmental math classes online, would I worry about cheating yeah. a, a lot more than I do now? Absolutely. Um, some ways that I've heard to help with that, or I think you're one person that mentioned this to me, was having them come and take it on campus in a lab setting. My husband is being, becoming licensed for architecture. He has to pay to go to a place to take tests, which I hate for students to have to pay, but if we're talking about students across the nation, they couldn't come to our lab to take a test. But there are ways, especially maybe for a, you know, a final exam that carries a lot of the weight in the course, to force them to go to such a place to take a test. <coughs> Just add, yes, the uh, final exam is required. Students are required to take final comprehensive exam in the classroom by the day. That is going on. Wait, even your online student? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay, and it's not a computer based It's No, uh -uh. I actually have no choice because uh, I can set them up in uh, our uh, computer classroom 104 and they can take it online or they can take it paper and pencil either one. But they're in the classroom with a proper, uh, proper exam. They can't look at anything else. So, yeah. Change of pace, I think. Uh, it's a question What is the chief quality a student needs to succeed in an online class? And is there a way to keep those that can't succeed out? <laughs>
just let them go the whole semester without addressing issues. But I think you do have to be a little more a little more flexible. Like if the quiz date passes and somebody just it slipped their minds, I let them. I open it up one, one time. Now if it happens more than once, then you know, oops, sorry. You know, kind of need to keep up. It's on the calendar. I think I've heard students say a lot that the calendar is really, really important. I've been at a, a, a event where students talked about being online students in the class, which is actually really beneficial and would be kind of cool, I think, for us here to hear students talking about how they feel about these things, too. Because they don't do their evaluations as much as you would hope. I have a miserable response, miserable responses to course evaluations from the online because they're not there. And even if, the, you know, you, you're not waiting, you're not handing them the piece of paper or whatever. And it's frustrating because I need that to, to do better. And we don't get a lot of it. Um, if anybody has any ideas, please share them because I send out all sorts of things. But I think it is we have to talk to them, send the emails out, but then also try to be a little flexible when there's something that may, may get missed. Because there is a lot, there are a lot of tools on that platform. I, I think it must be hard to go from high school where, you, where you're pretty much told where to be and what to do and how to do it to college and then to access, say, a totally online course, which is totally to my advantage on your own. Um, the students, my students tell me the biggest problem they have is Oh, your work is going to be due on Tuesday at 9 a.m., but the next class may be due Wednesday at 7 p.m., and the next one's due. They have trouble keeping track where if, when it's face-to-face, -face, they know they're going to turn in the work during the class time. So <clears throat> I typically cut it off about an hour before class so they're not late to class trying to, you know. <laughs> but, so this, this, this time management, this self-management uh, across a variety of classes is in, in and of itself, I think, a challenge. I don't think every student can do that. And I think that's a lot to throw at brand new students who are coming out of very structured high school classrooms. So uh, I'm intrigued about the question of, are, you know, should this be available for core? And for how can you tell which students will succeed and what? Mm -hmm. But do we have the resources to offer each class with a variety of uh, access options? Like this one will be face-to-face, -face, this section will be totally online, this section will be an hybrid. You know, I mean, how? How far can we stretch our resources to offer a variety of uh, ways to access the class? So, uh, but I don't think it's all or nothing. But I'm not sure what the answer is. In an earlier discussion last semester, several people were talking about this issue and said what what's needed. And I think they were talking about implementing it. So I'm going to look into it. Some pretest that said. You'd be qualified to do this if you take this little thing and you score it over 90. If not, we suggest you do that. That might weed some of them out. I have a couple more that I want to get through. Um, I, I'm going to summarize this one. I think that you, all of you said that you try to get to know your students and have them get to know you. How, how far do you, how, how close to a friendship do you try to get? I have a policy. I, I, don't, I don't accept students as my Facebook friends. Exactly. I just ignore those. What's Facebook? <laughs> What's Facebook? <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Any, any other comments? I, just a tool that I think is underutilized that I would suggest if anybody's kind of playing with this is if you haven't used the WIMBA tool, which I think we use in language a lot more. Um, you try the Wimba tools out. I have half of my discussions are the traditional kind of writing, writing back and forth, but I have audio discussions where they record their reactions to something they watched, or they, they when they do introductions, they do it orally, so that, and then they talk to each other. I mean, it's, it's asynchronous, of course, but still, they, they hear a voice, that, so that's a person instead of a name. And I go back and forth with them, oh, I really, I didn't know you did that. It's kind of the same stuff. So it's friendly in an appropriate manner, but it doesn't, I, I don't think I become friends at all. Now, if you've had more than one course, which I think we're in similar yeah, maybe situation. Maybe their dissertation. You know? Yeah, you're around them, and you already have history with them, or you develop a history along the way. But that voice chat or voice board or vo any of the voice stuff, it's worked really well for me, and I, they, they will comment on it. I really like being able to at least hear some of And students don't want friends. They don't want us to be their friends. They want us to answer their questions 
And so I do that, and I try to be prompt and respond to that. And I may do it in a, a casual, uh, informal kind of way, you know, using everyday language. But that, that establishes more of a personal relationship. I'm all for that, but uh, there's a big difference between a, a, a personal professor-student relationship than there is being their friend. And I suppose that favoritism, the, the perception of favoritism, is I saw a question. Yeah. This isn't my idea. I saw this at a meeting of someone who um, had an online math class, lower level math class, and he would have a video camera. He would record, like, hold up the person's test and say, okay, you did well on problem six and poorly on seven, and, or you know, some little comments like that, and it was about a two or three minute video for each person, and that he would send the link to the person. And he had fabulous response to No that. flash tires. No, it was a very, they loved some personal feedback. I thought that was very lovely. And I have a, a friend who takes, has webcam, takes a picture of themselves, always like this, or, you know, again, they send it along as an attachment, so there's a little bit of a vision. You know, it is cute. It is. Just real quick, go back to the print thing. How about LinkedIn? Do you, do you connect with the student on via LinkedIn? After class is a LinkedIn. After class, okay. After LinkedIn. I, I, I invite them the first day of class. Because I'm in a placement mode, and where I can capture them, where I can keep their email. So I'm, I'm just at the other end of it. Okay, I've got one more. We've got people leaving. Somebody wants a little help on how do you set up group work on Blackboard? Maybe who to see, where to go. How do you set up group work on Blackboard? Okay, well, um, I'm a bit of a mole, but um, I work for the Star Department. And well, if you use technology outside of Blackboard, I'd love to talk about technology. <laughs> So I've got classes coming up for Wimba Voice Tools, Wimba Classroom, Pronto. Joyce was in our Pronto class the other day. Um, and we've got a discussion with tools and group uh, training coming up. But call, uh, uh, email, make an appointment, and we can do one-on-ones if you can't make the training. And we can do some um, at a distance through Wimba, through all Very the good. tools. So Everybody got that? Did yeah. I'm Very good. The star department, so come talk to us. Are there any last minute questions that didn't get answered here? I have a comment. I have a question. I use the Wilma Live classroom quite a bit, and I do find that very interactive with students because a lot of time I'll come on with something really informal. To, you don't need to read a text, just come on, we're just going to chat. And a lot, a lot of times they have a question about their first big assignment, so we'll just talk about it. So I can see them, and they can see me, and they can see their classmates. And so I'll let them know that I'm going to log off now, but you, and I'll leave the classroom open so they can stay in and chat as long as they want to. And it's a really big thing. Yes, and you can archive it. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for coming. See you in the 16th.